It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Oh, hello there. Hi, 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 hello there. Welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show. It's me, Douglas Coleman. How are you? We've got Professor Craig Wright here today. And Professor Wright is a professor of music at Yale University, where he teaches the popular undergrad course Exploring the Nature of Genius. And his book, which he's promoting here, is called The Hidden Habits of Genius. So we get into a little bit of a discussion about music, music theory, and about his book. For more information about Professor Wright, you can go to craigwrightgeniusmusic.net, all one word. Just a quick note about our VE show. We have hit a milestone. We started the show about three months ago. started in August. And we have produced 50 shows at this point, which is pretty amazing. The show is doing very well. Currently, it's available on YouTube but we are working on a bigger distribution for the show right now. And perhaps in the near future, you'll see it on Roku and Amazon Fire and Apple TV and other places like that. So keep checking back. We'll see. We will be right back with Professor Craig Wright. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on the Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. Hi there, this is Stuart Epps, record producer. This is my story about Elton John, uh, working with him in those early years, going back to 1967 at Dick James, uh, all the amazing tours, those first recordings, uh, going through to Rocket Records, and uh, it's an amazing story about his incredible rise to stardom and my part in that. So uh, look forward to taking you on that journey. So here we go. Yeah, and to order this great audio CD, please just email me at stuartepps at talk21.com. That's Stuart, S-T-U-A-R-T, Epps, E-P-P-S, at talk, T-A-L-K, 21 in figures, dot com. Stuart Epps at talk21.com. Email me and I'll give you all the details for buying this brilliant audio disc. Thank you. Bye. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of the Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Tired of living in a culture of lies, fake news, and alternative facts? The Pro-Truth Pledge reverses the tide of lies by calling on politicians, and everyone else, to commit to truth-oriented behaviors. The Pledge asks signees to commit to 12 behaviors that research in behavioral science shows lead to truthfulness, such as clarifying one's opinions and the facts, citing one's sources, and celebrating people who update their beliefs toward the truth. Private citizens who sign the pledge get the benefit of contributing to a more truth-oriented society. Public figures get more substantive rewards for signing the pledge in the form of positive media and public recognition. The pledge crowdsources the truth by asking volunteers to evaluate the statements of public figures who sign the pledge. Take the pledge, demand that your elected representatives do so, and encourage your friends to take it at protruthpledge.org. Love coffee, huh? But wait a minute. It seems like every time you finish a cup of coffee, you get all of these side effects along with it. 
heartburn, digestion, upset stomach, acid reflux. As the world's first and only organic acid-free coffee, Tyler's Coffee is able to provide a healthier option in the solution for more than 100 million individuals who have sensitive stomachs or suffer from acid-related modalities. This is Tyler's Acid-Free Coffee. Coffee without the consequences. Are you an independent musician? How would you like to have your songs played on hundreds of radio stations just like the one you're listening to right now? Join MusicSubmit.com and we'll promote your music to radio stations and blogs in your genre. It's free to set up your account and we guarantee your music will be considered for airplay by radio stations worldwide. Why not sign up today? It's free. MusicSubmit.com. Radio promotion for indie musicians. Hi, this is John Morgan, production supervisor for DJC Productions. You're listening to The Douglas Coleman Show. Okay, please welcome to The Douglas Coleman Show, Dr. Craig Wright. Hello, Craig. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks very much for inviting me. Oh, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. I was looking at your bio. You're a professor of music. Is that correct? That is correct. I don't know if you know this or not, but I been a musician my entire life and the radio show sort of came out of music promotion um mm-hmm. i i'm one of those guys that you probably don't like <laughs> because i don't read music very well i studied it i failed music theory at the time that i took it i didn't understand why i needed it because i could play already and write music and it's funny to be able to write music and not read it, you know? But I think what I mean by writing music is I can write songs, uh, pop songs and write lyrics and things, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. I, I can't read the dots on the page. You know, somebody else would have to do that if I was to try to uh, script something. So I guess my first question is, is it necessary for people who have sort of an innate ear for music to learn all the, the theoretical parts of music? Um, it depends on what you want to do with it. I'd be interested to know if people such as Kanye, Kanye West read music. I mean, how many albums and how many downloads has he sold? Um, does Taylor Swift, is she, whatever your superstar is, the Lady Gaga... Uh, she didn't go to a music conservatory. She had a huge and natural gift, probably perfect pitch. Uh, but uh, it'd be, be interesting to know if she reads uh, music. It, um, did um, Thomas Edison know much in the way of math? No. And he was afraid that his uh, eldest son, who was about to get an MIT, uh, might be ruined if, if he became another Einstein. So there are people that are sort of naturally gifted in a particular field, but not educated. My uh, background in here was exactly the opposite. Um, I was hugely well uh, educated, and I had a very strong work ethic. The only thing that I was lacking, uh, unlike you, Douglas, uh, what I was lacking was natural talent. I didn't have perfect pitch. I couldn't, my musical memory wasn't that good. I didn't have strong hand-eye coordination where I could get immediately to that, infallibly and immediately to that key on the piano and so on. So there are different ways at at coming at this, and that's one of the things that I have found in my book. Uh, There's more uh, than one way to get across um, the the goal of of full line of genius, as I say in this book, The Hidden Habits of Genius. So you can play the piano then, correct? I beg your pardon. I didn't quite hear. hear oh, that. I said so. So you do play the piano, or you can play the piano? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I went to the Eastman School of Music. I graduated as a piano major. At Eastman School of Music—that's sort of big time. It's like Curtis or Juilliard, one of the right. major conservatories. So somebody puts uh, sheet music in front of you, and you can just rattle it right off on the piano. Is that is that right? Uh, if I practice, and it's a very good thing to do. I mean, if, I, if I'm if i doing a lot of piano, it's a, more, a moment I'm doing more writing than I am playing. And not writing music, but writing prose for books and articles and that kind of thing. Uh, but um, I do a sight read. Of course I can sight read. I've been trained to sight read. I used to uh, teach at East, when I was at Eastman, I'd take a course in piano accompaniment where I had to sight read. Um, but it's it's an acquired skill where you use m- music theory to very quickly analyze what is in front of you, and you it's pattern recognition. 
you see particular patterns, you recognize particular chord structures. Oh, if I see an E flat in the bass there, and I just had a B flat uh, before that in the bass, what I'm probably dealing with in the next chord is an E flat G B flat chord. So you're primed to pick up certain key indicators on, on that score, and uh, that allows you to move very quickly through the music. Oh, okay. Even if you've never heard the song before, right? Even if you've never heard it. Okay. It helps if it's in a tonal, so-called tonal idiom, right? You know what that is, Douglas, as opposed to atonal music of Schoenberg and, and modernist stuff like that. A lot, of, a lot of jazz is hard to track, too, because uh, it can get pretty far away from tone, a tonal center. Right. Well, isn't that kind of the point of some jazz where it starts out? It starts out like they'll take a song that's already been written and they'll start the melody and then each player will do his own solo, take it to wherever he wants to go. And as long as he brings it back <laughs> in time for the next right. guy to yeah. pick it up, then, yeah. then then it's good, right? Right. Yeah, I was never any good. I was never any good at that. And they, they seem to take pride. The farther you, you know, the real, the real fine jazz creators, the farther you could have taken it away from that tonal center, the more impressed your colleagues were. Uh, if you could ultimately bring it back, I, t I take it away and then figure out and forget how to get home. Well, I think I think uh, some jazz musicians have done that. You know, that they they go so far away from it they forgot where they started. But uh, yeah, I, that's interesting. Okay, I think that's the part of theory that I just never quite picked up. I, I just couldn't get it in my head at that point. I think I could now, you know, but. I don't. I don't really want to go and study something when I'm, you know, almost sixty years old. But if I had had that sense, see, if I had had you as a professor when I was twenty, I, I probably would have done better. Uh, okay, so you got a book out. Your book is called "The Hidden Habits of Genius." Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the book? Well, I started out as, as we were saying, Douglas. Um, trying to be a classical pianist, and that didn't work out. And then I went to Harvard to get a PhD in so-called musicology, and then I got interested in Mozart, and then I got interested in Leonardo da Vinci, and then in Einstein, and it all just seemed to snowball until I put together put together this course at Yale called Exploring the Nature of Genius. And after nearly 15 years of studying all this, I came to a set of conclusions that suggested that genius is very different than what we usually think think of genius being, and we could go through all of those, and in essence, that's what happens in, in that book. I say at the outset what genius is, because most people, when they talk about genius, don't really have a firm idea in their heads what the genius uh, is, and then I go through a list of these enablers, or drivers of genius, as I call them, uh, almost one by one, outlining what it is that Im actually empowers genius. So that's, in a, in a nutshell, what's in that particular book. Is there some commonality between people that have been called geniuses? I think that the principal comment, well, one uh, misconception is that they're all hugely smart. You know, they have a hu very high IQ score, and we could uh, drill down on that a bit if you want. But um, uh, that's what they don't have. What they have, the commonality, I think, the number one, obviously there are a number of them, but one is curiosity. Strangely, these people are always are all to a person extremely well read. Uh, whether it's somebody that you wouldn't expect being particularly well read, such as Thomas Edison, or somebody like his arch rival enemy Nikola Tesla, uh, Queen Elizabeth the first, and so on. These people read everything. Elon Musk is another good example of that. A voracious reader. Oprah Winfrey, another voracious uh, reader, with her uh, book club, and so. So they are. They want to get stuff in their head. They're relentlessly and endlessly curious, sort of lifetime learners, day in and day out, twenty four seven. Are people that are genius are they necessarily financially successful? I think when we get in our head a stereotype of the genius, we we up pops an image of somebody that's not particularly concerned with financial matters, doesn't worry about about the money. In point of fact, and this was one of the surprises to me, in point of fact, these geniuses 
are worried about the money. They realize they need the money. Even somebody as um, sort of as unexpected as Mahatma Gandhi, who went around in beggar's clothes, basically said, uh, "Without capital, we're going nowhere, or the world will be nothing." Uh, and, and that suggests that capital is needed to be able to finance the next enterprise. Um, Beethoven would have to uh, buy music paper. He'd have to pay copyists. He'd have to hire the performers. Uh, Picasso would have to uh, hire models. Uh, he would have to get the canvas. He'd have to get the paint, things such as that. If you want to send a rocket up into the air, such as uh, Jeff Bezos wants to do, or Richard Branson, or Elon Musk, then you've got to be able to, um, to finance that, and it can be very expensive. So they all uh, tend to realize that money is the kind of engine or fuel. No, let's say it is the fuel uh, that makes a genius possible. We all need it because it is this saved force of labor and materials that can be deployed later on to change the world for the positive. Okay, let me uh, change the question around in a different way. Yeah. Are geniuses or people that are considered geniuses, are they necessarily good at making money? Uh, not necessarily. <laughs> not, necess not necessarily, no. Um, but they can't be not good at it for very long, or they won't be able to affect their visions. Uh, they'll be out of business, they won't have changed the world, and we won't know about them as geniuses. So maybe, and it gets almost into a philosophical discussion at this point, uh, what is a genius? Somebody has the capacity to change the world but doesn't have any money to do so, and that might be a, a, a disadvantaged youngster somewhere. Um, or is it the person that has uh, access to money, to capital, and therefore can put his uh, vision of the world into play? So those are the issues that are in play. But if you go without this capital, this, this source of, of creativity, the thing that, that fires creativity, or at least makes it possible for a long period of time, then you're not going to be able to accomplish very much. It, as I look back on all of this and see it, and I could give specific examples uh, if you want, but, but maybe we've, we've pushed that as far as, as we can. It kind of goes back to music for me in a way because there are these people that are just people who I would consider geniuses in, in the music industry of what they've been able to create. And yet a lot of them, many of them, have had financial problems along the way and for many reasons. But it typically was that they were great at the creation but terrible at the business side because it's like two sides of your brain that you have to use. People that are really good with money tend to not be the ones that are the creators. They're the ones that are the organizers. They're the ones that, yeah, you well, know. That, that's sort of true. Yeah. No, no, I, I know what you're saying there. It's the people that provide the platform. It's the people that run the record companies. They're living in the big houses uh, along the coast. And maybe the musician is hit at once uh, big, and maybe they've got a good agent and get, get them a good uh, cut of the uh, – of the revenues that are flowing in, but maybe they've signed away their rights to their creativity at an early age because they were conned out of it, and therefore were conned out of those rights and don't end up with very much money. I, I, I think um, that's probably the case, particularly for younger musicians. I suspect as time goes on, they, they sort of wise up and, and get savvy. Uh, one could look at Michael Jackson, for example, uh, basically taking charge of his intellectual property and even being able, as I read it, uh, have read it, uh, being uh, so financially successful that he was able to buy out all of the um, old recordings of the Beatles. So right. he had control of the Beatles' intellectual property. So uh, you wouldn't think that that's, uh, you know, you don't think of Michael Jackson as being an entrepreneurial genius, but, but there he was sort of controlling the musical world for a while. Well, the ironic with that story is that Paul McCartney gave him the advice, unknowing that he was going to buy out his own music. So yeah. that was a funny story. Yeah, I, I think McCartney said at the time he, he was kind of rueful in that he was not able to to control or buy his own own intellectual property or his own uh, audio library, in effect.
Well, Michael beat him to the punch is what happened. Michael offered more for the catalog than they were asking. And McCartney just didn't, he just missed it, you know. So anyways, very interesting. Um, So, okay, your book is called The Hidden Habits. Give me an example of one of the habits of a genius. Aside, you told us about reading. Uh, Do you have another one? Yeah, here's one of my favorites. Um, and it just seems, I mean, it's, it's not particularly important, but it's something that I've learned to do over the years. So you asked me uh, a habit. I've gotten in the habit of doing the following. I keep a piece of paper, or actually a little book that somebody gave me called Thoughts of Genius, next to my bedstand. And I have another one in my, our master bathroom next to the shower. And I have learned that a good habit to get into is to think about, have a lot of stuff packed in your head because you've been very curious and you've got all these great ideas in there, but you can't quite sort them out. And then you'd be surprised at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning, all these things that you couldn't do yesterday or weren't making any sense or problems you've been working on, suddenly there's clarity there. There's connectivity there. And people that write books about neuroscience and write books about sleep habits and things such as that point out that there are neurotransmitters going through our brains at certain times during the night, during rapid eye movement, sleep, and things like this. And it, there really is a scientific reason why we are much more creative uh, at night during dreams and particularly early in the morning as our mind is allowing these thoughts to coalesce into into the solution or the answer or to a new idea. So um, that's a fun one to get into. And you won't blame me the other day. What the heck? I was trying to, oh, it doesn't, oh, glitch, because I'm I'm semi-dyslexic. I spent probably a minute trying to remember how to spell glitch. And I said in in the vernacular, uh, the heck with it, well, screw it. It's not worth my time. I'll move on. I'll come up with um, I'll have a substitute word problem. About three o'clock in the morning, so I wake up, and there it is. Glitch, telling me how to spell this particular word, G-L-I-T-C-H. <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, and it, but that's a trivial example, but there are far more serious examples of that, and I used that particular technique uh, just this morning with something I want, was trying to write about vaccination, smallpox, and, and the COVID uh, ep- epidemic. Um, and vaccination, and I got up first thing. I wrote those thoughts down so as not to forget them. So that's a that's a silly little habit, but one that works for me. And I could keep going on, but uh, uh, maybe uh, maybe we've had enough of that. Well, we're just kind of running out of time, is unfortunately. So we do have to kind of wrap this up. Do you have a website? Mm-hmm. That people can yeah, come. Yeah, I, I do, you know. and I, I like and love it when people engage me, and they can. If any of your listeners want to get back to me, there's a contact uh, uh, drop down there, uh, a contact page. So you just click on that, and up will come over. So it's Craig C R A I G Wright W R I G H T. That's all one word or all one construction. Craig Wright Genius Music dot net. Again, all one long thing. Craig Wright Genius Music dot net. Uh, and if you have questions or want to talk with me, discuss things further, that's a good way to do it. Okay. Are you on social media at all? I, I, not, not so much. I no. prefer to use this, this, this website. I think the website works better. Social media has, as we all know, uh, is both a boon and a bane. Yeah, true so, enough. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm shifting over to this website, which I find uh, more efficient. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing about your book and uh, about your music. Travels in music. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, music, music is an interesting uh, process, and, and it leads you in, in a number of different ways, as you yourself know, because you've got a rec- you know, a... a uh, a radio show here, and uh, you started out probably wanting, as I did, wanting to be a performer. Yeah, a long time ago I did. This is how it's uh, manifested itself now. Changed from being a stage performer to a uh, studio performer. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Well, thank nice you. Nice talking to you. Thank you, me. It was fun. Okay, take care.